I'm going to tell you the story of Somnium. And I'll tell you the story, and I'm going to run my artworks in the background. So these are the, um, the artworks that I made that are based on the text. And the way I make these is I call them multiprints. Um, I basically run the same sheet of paper through a printer several times and print images on it at random. So what I've done is I read the story, I sourced images that uh, are mentioned in the story, like for example, there's Kepler there, uh, and you'll see later on, you know, maybe there's a volcano or they mention a planet, and I made lots of folders. And so I had all this whole atlas of images. And then uh, whatever sort of fit together thematically and in a chapter, I would then start printing them. And I, I tend to be too controlling when I work and when I paint, and this was a good way for me just to let go a little bit and invite chance. Uh, not all of the prints turned out great, but once in a while something would kind of look interesting, and then I paint on top of it. So this is all, all this stuff is paint. So I go over it with acrylics and inks to pull the composition together and basically um, just edit things out and paint new things inside. So that's my title page. And so the whole, whole story of the Somnium uh, starts in Iceland. And Kepler had never been to Iceland. He'd really never left Germany. The reason he picked Iceland as the uh, prime location for his story was that he found it interesting geographically because it's located at the top of the earth. And it has volcanoes that reach down into the center of the earth. He thought it was like uh, the place that connected heaven and hell. And also because it's in sunlight half of the year and in darkness half of the year, he thought it was kind of mythical and a fantastic location to uh, start his story. And he invented two people that are the main characters. So there's this old lady called Fjox Hilde. I don't know if that's actually an Icelandic name, I doubt it. And her young son is called Durakotus, which also does not really sound very Icelandic to me. But you know, maybe for, for a German guy in 1600, that sounded really exotic. Uh, also in the 1600s, people tended to Latinize their name, you know, like Copernic became Copernicus. So it was also kind of fashionable to have Latin sounding names. Anyway, so Durakotus is the hero of the story. And when he's a little kid, him and his very ancient mother, she's, she's insanely old, we don't know why, but she's this very old woman who is very wise. And she knows about herbal lore and about all kinds of ancient things. And she spends her day and she earns her living by um, roaming the hills of Mount Hecla and, cr and collecting herbs and making little satchels of herbs and, and little tap things with runes on them. And she sews them into little bags and she sells them to the fishermen and the captains for good luck and for medicine. And the little boy sort of basically sort of bumbles along. The father is long gone. He apparently was this very, very old man and where he disappeared to was not really mentioned in the book. Uh, but then Durakotus becomes older and he becomes a teenager and he becomes adventurous and annoying. And one day he doesn't, uh, he's left alone in the house and he starts to rummage through his mother's affairs. And he takes a couple of these bags that she made. He, st she, he starts pulling them open and poking around because he's never been explained what this woman is actually doing there. So he's, he's basically destroying all her inventory. And she gets really, really mad. And because now he's ruined everything and she has nothing left to sell and she's the only breadwinner. So what she does is instead of uh, selling her bags of herbs at the port, she sells her son. She basically said, you ruined my income for the year. I'm selling you to sea. And you can learn some manners and you're gonna learn how to grow up and toe the line. And uh, he was unceremoniously put on a boat uh, with the sea captain, and they set off. Uh, very surprised to Rakotos, and he did not enjoy the sea voyage at all. He was this, you know, s skinny little boy, and he was used to cold weather. And suddenly they were sailing south toward Europe, and there was a lot of warm air, and he felt unwell, and he got seasick. 
and he didn't like all the nasty men, and he just wanted to get off the boat. Uh, so what happened next was that he discovered through the captain that they were going to deliver a letter. That was the first port of call, was in Denmark. And they were going to dis uh, deliver a letter to this guy, Tuco Brahe. He's a very interesting character. He's the only person in the book who actually existed. Uh, he was a Danish astronomer who uh, actually was a little older than Kepler. And Tuco Brahe is best known for cataloging the entire night sky, measuring all the stars before the telescope was invented. He was an insanely rich aristocrat, uh, for some reason beloved by the king. The king loved him so much, the king gave this guy a whole island on which he then built a castle uh, dedicated to science and math called Uraniburg. And you can see in the background this, this perfectly geometric shape that was the blueprint of this place called Uraniburg. And he hired lots of people from all over Europe to help him calculate and measure and make drawings. And so he cataloged the entire night sky. This is how Kepler knew him. But um, Tuco Brahe is also an interesting guy because for a couple of other reasons. He's very vivacious and eccentric and extravagant. Uh, he got, for example, he had a golden nose, which you don't really see in his portraits. You see in this portraits, he looks like he has a regular nose. That was not the case. The reason he had the golden nose was because he got into a duel when he was a student at university. And you would think that when a young man gets into a duel, it would be over a girl. But no, he got into a duel over a point of mathematics. So he was uh, basically in an argument with a fellow student, challenged the other student to a duel in the dark with a rapier, got his nose <laughs> cut off. <laughs> Can you just imagine, I mean, that, like the balls <laughs> of this guy? <laughs> and then, so he had his nose actually cut off like this. Like, like right there. So he had a bit of nose left, but not much. So luckily, he was also really interested in alchemy and uh, metallurgy. So he cast himself a new nose out of gold. How about that for one upmanship? <laughs> and then he had in his vest a little bit of putty and he would like stick his nose on. They found uh, in his coffin a residue on his skull of copper, so they're thinking that he probably had like an everyday nose out of copper, and then when the king came around, he had the golden nose. Uh, there is only one or two um, portraits where you can actually see like that's hinted at that he had a golden nose. He also had a pet moose, which he would bring to parties. Um, the animal died because it got drunk and fell down a <laughs> flight of stairs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he had a fortune -telling, uh, telling dwarf that he would keep <laughs> under the table at dinner. So like this really big, rambunctious guy. And Kepler was this like this little skinny, nerdy guy who basically went for like long walks in the rain, and like they did not get along. And actually, um, Tuco Brahe died, uh, and people always suspected Kepler because they were kind of working together. And Tuco Brahe. Uh, did not want to give all the research to Kepler. He sort of was giving it to him drip, drip by drip. Uh, but this document in this book, I mean, the, the picture Kepler paints of Tycho Brahe is so flattering that I think it's hard to believe that uh, Kepler actually had anything to do with Tycho Brahe's demise. Um, but you, you, if you ever like hear these two names mentioned together, you probably hear something about that. Uh, that story. But in the Somnium, basically Tycho Brahe takes the young Duracotus under his wing. Uh, he comes there with his ladder and wants to get off the boat, so he stays off the boat and Tycho Brahe takes the young Duracotus and basically teaches him astronomy. Duracotus stays there for a bunch of years and learns math and learns uh, everything about the night sky and basically graduates and um, one night he looks at the moon and he remembers his mother who also look, used to look at the moon and he gets homesick. He wants to go back home. So he takes his leave and hops on a boat and goes back to Iceland hoping that his mom is still around. And she is and she's like super happy to see him because she was kind of, she's a little regretful of her impulsive act of selling her son uh, and then he disappears. Uh, so he comes home and there's this joyful reunion and she is so proud and impressed to learn that he learned astronomy because she said, well, you may not know, 
but I also have an interest in the moon. In fact, uh, I frequently talk to spirits. They come and visit me. Uh, they come down from the moon and we have a little chat. Uh, and Dürer quote is, course, you do tell. Uh, how can I meet one of these spirits? And she goes, well, it so happens. It's very rarely the occasion, but it's kind of the right time. I can summon a spirit for you. And so they both hunker down. And uh, so in the story, it describes the night sky, how Saturn is in the eye of, the, of Taurus. And uh, she makes a kind of hand movements. And the spirit appears. So this, the, it's in the book, it's not really, it's kind of called a spirit. It's called a daemon, which in Greek apparently means wise spirit, and uh, not demon, like you may associate that. Uh, and so he, he, the spirit comes down, and, and it's also not called really the moon, because Kepler is trying to be very oblique about the whole thing, again, to try to get around the church. And he calls the moon Levania. So he says this island that floats in the sky, Levania, has these spirits living on it. And one of the reasons that they really like to come to visit in Iceland is that they like the dark. So it's lots of darkness in Iceland, so they come down a lot. 